clock module I showed you from our prior video and this is what I came up with for it. I made myself a little box out of oak and stained it and I've got a piece of glass in the front here. The thing is I want to put a back on it now and I want to put some remote switches because I'm not going to be able to access those to set it. So what I've done is I've just made myself a, a little plastic back because the circuit board sticks out a little bit from the back. I've made myself a little plastic uh, back out of a couple of old broken power supply cases. We're going to put it on the back like that and then fill this space up top here with something to block off any additional light. We're just going to attach this to the back and uh, <clears throat> drive a couple screws through it. One thing that uh, has really drives me crazy, I don't know why so many manufacturers only make Phillips screws. If you ever try to start threading something with a Phillips screw, you end up in pain pretty quick because there's nothing to hold this screw in place while you're trying to thread it. And you end up slipping and potentially harming yourself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a Robertson, a Robertson screw being the square head. A real Robertson though, not one of these fake square head. Real Robertson screws are only available in Canada and real Robertson screwdrivers are only available in Canada because it's a Canadian invention. But the screw won't fall off the screwdriver, you see? This is not magnetic. Just the way the screw head is designed and the screw they'll stay there and that means I can put full pressure on here to start this thread and thread the screw in for my back cover. So now I've got the hole started. I'll do the same thing on the other side. I'm going to put another screw in here just at the edge of the cabinet here. Now you would not catch me doing this with a Phillips type screw unless I want to uh, end up stabbing myself and that's happened. Okay we've got the cover threaded now so we can screw it on here. I've got my I've got three little switches here one for the fast set, one for the slow set and one for the reverse. I'm also going to wire up this other switch because this has a stopwatch capability so I'm going to throw a toggle switch on here on one side of it so you can throw the switch and use this as a timer and then these buttons control the start and stop and the reset of the stopwatch function. So I'm just going to uh, get some wire. I'm going to put some wire on these switches so I can attach it to the appropriate place on the circuit board. We're basically just going to parallel the existing switches that are there. So what I've got here is I've just given myself some uh, wire roughly equal length. I'm just going to strip the wires and solder them onto the switches. Therefore I can mount the switches into the back cabinet and then we'll wire them up to the uh, we'll wire them up to the, the, the circuit board. One of the nice things about salvaging old TVs is that uh, I get to keep a lot of the wiring harnesses and stuff which comes in nice and handy. Don't have to buy hookup wire. I've got lots of wiring harnesses that have got multiple conductors and I can just cut pieces off as I need it. So that's that's an advantage when you're when you're scrapping old electronics, which is what I do for the unrepairable units as I take out the boards and stuff that I could reuse. And I take out all the wiring harnesses because uh, copper wire always comes in handy when you want to hook something up or make a project or just need something, you know, short pieces of wire. It's always, it always can be reused. Recyclers, the recycling guy probably is tired of seeing me because when I bring up stuff to be recycled, it's usually just the empty cabinet and a broken display or or something um, that really doesn't have much salvage value as far as the recyclers are concerned because of course the the recycling companies where they make their money is recovery of metals and stuff out of the sets recovery of gold out of integrated circuits, recovery of uh, recovery of copper and stuff out of circuit boards and out of components. And When I bring them stuff, well there's generally not much left in them. Maybe a little bit of plastic, which I don't know that they really want the plastic. It's kind of a byproduct. Uh, but they're looking for the metals and whenever I take something in, well there's not much metal left in it. So uh, I don't think they're happy, too happy to see me. Anyway, let's get these switches soldered on. And we'll get them connected to the circuit board here 
and make this unit work. Most expensive part of this project is these switches that I had to buy. Everything else on this project, oh and, and the 10 kilowatts of electricity that I had to use in my car to drive to the component store to buy the switches. I got these switches for I think they were like a dollar, a dollar fifty a piece. So it's three switches. The other one, the fourth switch I salvaged. Three switches, four fifty, and I used about a dollar twenty of electricity to drive my electric car to the big city to uh, buy them. Everything else that's on here, the, the the module was taken out of a an old RCA. Uh, VHS machine, my first VHS machine that I bought in 1979 and when the recorder went to the dump I should have kept that recorder because it actually I think it even still worked when I scrapped it just the the, uh, the pulleys and stuff were wearing out right the uh, the drive pulleys but I had so many other machines I just dumped it but thinking back now I probably should have kept that machine just as a collector's item but I do have other machines that are equally as old and I'll, I'll show them off on future videos I have an old uh, top loader JVC somewhere kicking around here and uh, an old beta hi-fi unit which we'll be showing you at some some point. So now I've got the correct size mounting holes drilled. We can go and proceed to mount the switches. Now you see how I fastened, I, I glued a couple of supports on the bottom of the circuit board here and I, I drilled holes and put screws in at an angle which anchors the clock completely in place so that the uh, display doesn't get damaged. Now we'll just attach our fast, slow and reverse um, wires for our switches. First I have to determine which, which contacts on the switch do what, so we'll get the meter out here. That way I can see which, which uh, side of the switch does which. which. So this should be the, the end contacts here when I close the switch. That's what I thought. Good. So now we know which ones. We're just going to use the, the end connections here. The switch has got four um, soldered down to the board in four places, but the front and back are, are parallel together. So it's just a matter of soldering in my switches here for fast, slow, and reverse. We'll just tack it down to the board. Leave the other switches in place. We don't need to remove them. They won't be accessible once I finish the job. There's no need to actually remove the switch. And then I have to figure out which two to put together to make it go into stopwatch mode. It's on this other switch here. Short two leads together and it becomes a stopwatch. I know that because I can put the switch in between. I can put it between the start and stop time because it's got a timer built in it as well. I haven't bothered to wire up the timer function for this. I was going to make it into a time clock and then I thought, you know what? just instead of having it as a timer, I don't really need a digital timer for anything at this point, a 24 hour timer I just want it as a nice desk uh, clock to display the time so I left that out but it would be nice for being able to time something so I figure the stopwatch function will be useful you'll now be able to see that I'm able to set the time using the new buttons that I've placed on it. Now we just have to figure out which pins I have to short together to turn it into a stopwatch. I close a couple pins together on the set switch for the setting the time. It should go to start it should go to stopwatch mode. There it is. 
it. That to those two. So, I actually have to put two of them together. So for that I'll need a double pole switch or maybe a couple diodes to um, put both those contacts together at the same time. It's just the way it's diode steered. That's why when you put the switch in between it would you put the switch halfway in between it would short the start and stop together along with the uh, it's a, it's a three-way switch here, three-position switch. Have to have a have to have a, du a double pull single throw switch instead of a single pull single throw to do what I want to do. So I got to find another I got to find another little switch, the double pull switch, and then uh, I can make that a reality. So because I don't have a double pull switch handy today, I'm just going to put this back on it here. We'll screw this through the cabinet into the wood. And then when I come up with a double pull single throw switch, I will pull the back off it again and add that switch. There. Now when this is sitting on a shelf or hanging up on the wall. I have a little wire up here so I can hang it on a wall as well by a hook. Now with this thing sitting on the shelf, you won't see any light leaking in from the back. At least you won't once I cover up the space with some black tape. So we'll just get a couple strips of tape just to cover up this little gap here. There, that covers up any light leakage from the back. We can do the same thing on the bottom here. There you go. You never see that when it's sitting on the shelf. Now there's no light that leaks in from behind. And I have myself a really nice digital clock made from a couple of scrap pieces of wood and an old fluorescent vacuum display clock module from an old VCR and now I can oh, gotta cover that up too you can see a little bit through the light through the back there now I can set this thing easily backwards and forwards and fast hope you enjoyed this we'll catch you in the next one